Reading 95 From the Psychological Commentaries on the Teachings of Gurdjieff and Elspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nicoll, Volume 1 Birdlip, November 20th, 1943 A Brief Talk About Dreams Dr. Nicoll is here speaking about dreams from the standpoint of the teaching that he had from Dr. Jung. Part 1 this work does not speak directly about dreams. However, certain things are said about dreams. The main thing says is that it is useless to study your dreams and that all psychological systems based on the study of dreams are fantastic because immediately you begin to study your dreams, they alter. Some of you know that in modern physics, the discovery has been made that when you investigate the microphysical, the world of atoms, you interfere with what you are investigating. Your instruments for investigation interfere with what you are investigating. Now you all know that one of the difficulties of self-observation, such as observation of your thoughts, is that observation interferes with your thoughts. This is especially the case when you try to observe your forms of imagination. Immediately, you try to observe your imagination, it stops. That is to say, the instrument for observation interferes with what you observe. To take a gross example, suppose you suddenly strike a match to see whether there is a mouse in the room. You interfere with what you are observing and probably the mouse disappears. Now, in the case of dreams, the work teaches that once you begin to pay attention to them, you interfere with them and so change them. And it is for this reason that the study of dreams as a psychological method of approach to oneself is definitely discouraged. But the work teaches something further about dreams. For example, the work says that there are many different kinds of dreams not recognized in Western psychology. Dreams, the work teaches, are of every kind because they can come from every center and every part of a center. In a conversation I once had with G, he remarked that most dreams come from moving center, from haphazard connections taking place in moving center. Strictly speaking, most dreams come from instinct moving center. That is, they are echoes of things seen during the day, sensations and movements. Such dreams are echoes of the life of instinct moving center during the daytime. They have no meaning and so are of no importance. But dreams can also come from other centers. Instinct moving dreams are generally speaking chaotic. Then again, some emotional impression such as a fright may enter into these instinct moving dreams, especially if the fright connects itself with earlier fears which one has consented to and not worked against. But the point that I wish to emphasize now is that the work teaches that there are different kinds of dreams originating in different centers and different parts of centers. This means that there are intellectual dreams, emotional dreams, sexual dreams, moving and instinctive dreams. And there are also dreams that come from the centers we do not use, higher emotional and higher intellectual centers. I would say one thing at present, that dreams that come from the higher parts of emotional center or even from higher emotional center are always characterized what can be roughly called dramatic formulation. Let us suppose that a person experiences a very dramatic and well-formed dream. He wonders why he had this dream, which seems to have nothing to do with his ordinary life. How, he says to himself, can such a dream arise which has nothing to do with my own thoughts or experiences? Why should I have such a dream? From what source did this strange experience come? Has it any meaning or not? Most of us admit that occasionally we are visited by very strange dreams, sometimes very wonderfully worked out and containing some meaning that we cannot catch. 
Now, if you will all think about the ray of creation and about how we have in us higher and lower centers and higher and lower parts of centers and how influences come down the ray of creation from higher levels, it is not so surprising if we find that there are influences in us that are trying to cure us, trying to make us understand ourselves and our inner situations and states better. But it is quite clear that the language of dreams is not our ordinary language. Suppose that the ray of creation and all that it means is quite true. Suppose that the idea of Jacob's ladder is quite true. Suppose that angels are blowing trumpets in our ears to make us hear better. Suppose that higher intelligence is working on us and in us at every moment, only we cannot hear its words or understand its meaning. Is it extraordinary that we may receive and be in touch with greater mind than our own? Do you remember that the work teaches about higher centers? It teaches that higher centers are fully developed in us and are always transmitting meaning to us, only we cannot hear them. We cannot hear their finer vibrations. We are tuned into the life of the earth and of the five senses. Very often, G used to say that we must listen to ourselves and that if we would only listen to ourselves before embarking on some enterprise, we would realize how useless it was. But what do we listen to in our ordinary daily lives, in our lives of ordinary sleep? We listen to the crudest eyes, the most mechanical eyes, the eyes turned out to external life and its small adventures. We listen to our jealous eyes, our off-ended eyes, our negative eyes, and so on. And so it is in this sense that we cannot hear these influences that are continually coming down to us from higher centers. We do not even listen to our reason, to the higher parts of our ordinary centers. And yet, all the time there are influences, so clearly expressed in the diagram of the ray of creation, that are trying to touch us and make us understand better and cure us of our life maladies, and so lead us to our own inner development. Sometimes these influences reach us in the form of dreams. When we are cut off from our five senses, the external world registered by them fades away and we pass into another world, the world of our invisible selves, which this work is about. I suppose that every one of you has had some dream that has made you wonder, some dream that you do not permanently forget, some dream that has some strange quality about it. To those of you who have had moments of self-remembering in life, when you have seen some quite ordinary thing or person in an entirely new way, it will not be astonishing if I say that such moments have the same quality or inner taste as have those rare and unusual dreams of which I am speaking. You suddenly see new meaning, and in the case of dreams, you feel that they have new meaning of the same order, although you cannot grasp it, as when you realize the ray of creation in yourselves and particularly the side octave from the sun. When you begin to see their significance, you will not be surprised if I say that there are forces in you working upon you all the time to make you awaken, to heal you, to cure you, if you can only listen to them. The uproar of the personality prevents us from hearing the continual action of the false personality with all its intrigues literally makes us deaf blind and dumb so that everything is swayed of, even what we call our most sincere moments. You understand what a dumb man means in the Gospels. A man who can never speak from his understanding is a dumb man. A man who is always talking from the eyes of false personality is a dumb man dumb because he can never say anything real. Just in the same way, a blind man is one who can never see anything, never see the meaning of anything. And a deaf man is a man who can never hear anything, even when it is said time and time again. He has no mental ears to hear with. We are all deaf, dumb, and blind as regards the teaching as given throughout the ages, and only Christ, 
the work can cure us. Not only this, but we are deaf, dumb, and blind to ourselves, to those higher centers in us that are continually telling us what to do, only we cannot understand their language. So please realize that you have the work in yourselves already, all of you, and that the external form of the work and the teaching and study of it and the practicing of it is to open you to what is already in you, to something that we have all lost contact with owing to falling asleep. So it is not strange that sometimes we have experiences that seem to have nothing to do with what we believe is our soul form of life, and that sometimes when the external senses are stilled, we experience dreams that are quite extraordinary about which we understand nothing. Now, as regards dreams that have a trace of emotional or higher emotional center in their formation, I will simply say that they are practically always about oneself. They tell you about your inner situation and inner state. Sometimes they represent your inner state in terms of people and situations. The people may or may not represent different eyes in yourself. The general situation you are in, psychologically speaking, may be represented as buildings, scenery, and so on. The dream may be entirely subjective, entirely about yourself and your inner state. Or it may have a certain objective reference as well, and refer to how you are behaving to an actual person, and so on. Or it may represent your inner state in such a way as to show you how you are taking something quite wrongly as from some former life way of taking things. You know that we have to take everything in a new way in the work. Sometimes a dream which has a trace of emotional center behind it will give you a picture of the work and your relationship to it. Of course it will be mixed up with personal associations, with personality, but the general form and meaning may come through, as it were. I will quote an example of a dream of this kind which is about life and the work and about the danger of mixing the two in one's thinking and in one's evaluation. It relates to the fact that if one wishes to work, one must be very careful how one walks in life. The dream is as follows. We were living at a kind of farm. Work people were around us. The peculiarity of this farm was that Wherever you walked, you had to travel on duckboards, raised on stilts, above a swamp of all kinds of filth and muck, such as you find in a farmyard. If you slipped, you plunged into it, and anything you dropped was lost in it. When we sat at table and in conversation, forgot what was beneath us, we would suddenly awake to the fact that our feet were dangling in the filthy stuff. We had to remember all the time to hold them up above it. Here is a strange dream. If we take it literally, it is about duckboards, mud, stilts, and so on. One might very well say, on waking up, what have I to do with this farm lying on mud in which it is necessary to be very careful where one walks? But why should this well-formulated dream come? What does it represent in its imagery? What ideas lie in this dream? For instance, do you think that it might represent identifying with life? Do you think that it might represent how one must always remember oneself in walking about in life? In this dream, it is said that if you drop anything, it is lost. The work says that everything you do mechanically is lost to you. And what does the work say about talking? Does it not say that here we forget ourselves most of all? And yet I say that this dream was dreamt just as quoted without knowledge of what it meant. Think about this dream. For in a sense, it is for all in the work. Do you think life should be like what you expect? Or have you grown up and seen the necessity of making your own life? Life is filth unless you learn the science of duckboards and stilts and so on. But most people are immersed in this filth and like to stay in it. The language of dreams is not our formatory language. A dream is not put in the form of words. It is put in a language of imagery. It is exactly comparable with the language of parables. It is quite true that parables are expressed by means of words, but they indicate images. You all know you do not dream in words, but if you want to describe your dream, you have to turn it into words, and you soon lose its meaning. 
In fact, you cannot express it in words save in a very poor way. Parables are the other way around. They are expressed in words, usually very simply, but they transmit imagery. The parable gives the imagery by means of words. The meaning, however, does not lie in the words, but in the imagery. A literal-minded person may think that an actual sower went forth to sow, an actual seed fell on stony ground, etc., but the whole parable of the sower and the seed transcends the words completely and passes into the language of higher emotional center, which uses only images, and so is universally understandable. We see the beginning of a universal language, which is the language of higher emotional center. One of the most extraordinary things is that people imagine they are related only to the external world. The work teaches that we are related to an inner, invisible world, and that where we are in this invisible world is the most important thing. Many dreams refer to where we are in this inner, invisible world from which our nightmares arise and from which much of our unhappiness comes. Each one of you is related to different eyes, to different parts of, as it were, an enormous building about which you may sometimes dream. Which room are you in? Within ourselves we have rooms where we can live in discomfort or comfort, and in ourselves we have a radio that we can switch on to one set of influences or another set of influences. The world today has gone so far into the external senses and into matter that it seems extraordinary to most people that there is another world to which they have to make relation in order to have any peace of mind and any center of gravity, an internal world that one can only begin to realize by means of self-observation, by observing I, which is an internal sense organ. Try to notice where you are in yourself at this moment, to what thoughts you are consenting, with what feelings you are identified. Have you yet attained any power of inner freedom from yourself, from your mechanical reactions, your mechanical thoughts and feelings induced by external circumstances? Or are you taking everything in the way you have always taken everything? Your inner, invisible world is much larger and contains far more interesting things than this external world that you are always looking out upon through the five windows of your senses. And in this inner, invisible world of yourselves, influences are always playing upon you from higher and lower levels. And all higher influences are trying to heal you, trying to make you understand how to live in this world. But as you know, as long as we are identified with all our sufferings, all our false personality, buffers, accounts, self-pity, memory of the past, with what we think will give us happiness, then we cannot feel these influences that can free us and make us grow.